I don't know if we'll mention that, but we are making sure we tell all the archive groups. Okay, we should get started. Okay, folks, thank you all. I see the last few people are getting seated. Uh, we will, this is the spring working group. I'm Joel Halpern, one of your co-chairs. Next to me is Alvaro Retana. And on remote, as you can see, is Bruno de Crane. Bruno will be running us through the chair slides, and then we will go through the presentations. Uh, look forward to discussion. The point of this whole thing is engagement from the working group, not people standing up and just reciting. And as far as we know, all the presenters have that in their mind. So please do bring up questions, issues. We hope you have read the draft. Bruno, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're starting the, the meeting. This is the usual note well. Uh, this is a list of uh, some uh, IHF policies that you need to apply to. So you probably want to uh, read them if you're not aware of. Um, this is a uh, uh, 117 meeting tips. If you're in-person participants, please make sure to use the uh, Meet Echo client on site. Uh, this is the new uh, blue sheet system, and also you, you will need this to uh, join the mic queue. And if you're a remote participant, uh, please make sure to turn off your audio and video if you're not using it. This is some resources for ITF. Um, the minutes for spring will be collaborative, shooting will take them, but please feel free to, to help. Especially if you are commenting, uh, please check uh, your, your name and that your comments are accurate. Okay, so we had some discussion um, since last uh, since, since Yokohama regarding the use of uh, IPv6 uh, destination options versus the use of uh, TLVs in SRH. Because for some use cases, uh, we could put the data in, in either either one. And we had a, a discussion in the minutes about that. Uh, the URL is uh, here if you want to, to do a check. And as a result, we publish a new uh, policy for spring. So in short, if uh, the information is generally applicable to IPv6 nodes, it should, not, it should go in the IPv6 destination option. On the other hand, if information is specific to SRH, it should go in SRH TLVs. And in any case, we should not define the same information in both places. So again, you have the URL if you want the, the, full, uh, the, full, the full policy. Now we had, uh, we had ISG reviews for, for some documents. And it came back that we had some uh, some comments regarding security of uh, SRV6. So uh, our ID asked us to uh, to write to to work on that, and so we would like to have a document providing a, a solid security analysis of SRV6. Uh, we don't have such document currently, so the chairs will uh, select a team of partners to to do the analysis and write that. Uh, it's, uh, it will be individual document until it's uh, approved by the working group. So please, if you'd like to, to volunteer for the work, uh, please send an email to the chairs to, to volunteer. We need, uh, we need participants to, to work on that. 
So we'll send uh, we'll send shortly uh, an email uh, on the mailing list to uh, to request for for people. In terms of the document status, uh, we did an adoption call for segment routing header encapsulation for alternate marking. Uh, the result is that the document is not adopted. And the reason is that we uh, already have a, a DOH option in IPv6 for that. And uh, there is no compelling reason to duplicate uh, the work in, in SRH GLV. We did another adoption call for our circuit style segment routing policies, and the document has been adopted. So again, you have uh, URLs and links. Uh, we are doing um, a working adoption for uh, the distribution of SRV6 locator in DHCP. We had uh, some good uh, reaction and feedback. But uh, an issue was raised, so we are waiting for uh, an update of the draft. And finally, we have a new uh, document in the RSC Editor queue. Uh, thank you, Jim, which is, which is integration of a uh, network service header on segment routing for, for service function chaining. And currently, we have a ISG review on SR replication segment for multiple multi-point service delivery. So that's one of uh, an example of ISG review for which we had uh, a comment on issue on, uh, on security considerations. Uh, so you may look at uh, at the discuss abstain on, on comments if you want. If you want more details. And finally, we submitted a, a document for publication, which is a past segment in MPLS-based segment routing network. Uh, status is we need a, a revised uh, Sheffield write-up on, on my side, because we, we change uh, the Sheffield. Finally, this is the agenda for, for today. We have a full agenda. So please, uh, please focus on, on the discussion. Is there any uh, comment on the agenda? Any agenda batching before we start? So if not next on the agenda is uh, a working document, which is about a uh, compressed service six segment list encoding in SRH. And presenter is, is Francois. Uh, hi, uh, Jeff. Do you hear me? Uh, I will yes, present. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, I will share my screen. Or... So, Joel, do you want to, to share the slides to have a shorter RTT? Oh, sorry. I, I, just a minute. I will. Uh... Thank you. My apologies, Ms. Dara. Yeah, that's okay. No, that was the wrong button, sorry. There, share preloaded slides. Yeah. So can I start? There we go. And go ahead. OK. OK. Thank you. So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Wei Chang from China Mobile. Uh, I'm here on behalf of uh, authors to report the draft update. Uh, the presentation will uh, consist uh, uh, of two main parts. The first part uh, covers the major changes uh, since the working group adopted. Uh, and the second part, uh, we will address the 
five open issue uh, when the draft uh, was uh, adopted. So next page. <laughs> yeah. So uh, according to the comments received, we uh, have made uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, changes. Uh, we uh, defined uh, the CC the flavors for the remaining IFC uh, 89, 86 seeds, uh, such as uh, N.T, N.B6, uh, N.BM. Uh, and dot BM, uh, for the both next CC the uh, flavor and uh, replace CC the flavor. And then we removed uh, next and replace CC the flavor uh, because it's too uh, complicated and uh, a lack of uh, implementation. Uh, so uh, what we would like to see uh, now, uh, the next CC and uh, uh, replace CC the flavors can be used together in the same SRH. So uh, if uh, uh, someone hope uh, they can uh, use uh, the both flavor uh, together. And uh, uh, for the uh, clarity, we added uh, the complete uh, set of code uh, in the appendix uh, for the both uh, next CC and uh, replace the CC. Next page. Yeah, we add a new section uh, for the SR source node. Uh, in this section, we specify uh, how the SR source node uh, may leverage the CC flavors to produce a comprised SRV6 seed list encoding. Uh, the original uh, seed list uh, may comprise any combination of the Nexus seed, replace the seed, or uh, other kinds of seeds. Uh, we also uh, extended uh, the control plan. Uh, the draft specifies how the uh, seed uh, are advertised using existing SRV6 control plan extensions. So next page. Yeah, uh, we also add a new section uh, to describe uh, the operational considerations, uh, such as uh, how to pin a seed of, uh, of the draft, uh, how the SMP error processing. Uh, we also add a new section uh, about uh, the uh, deployment uh, uh, model. Uh, the same SR domain deployment model uh, as specified uh, in FC 8754. Uh, and uh, uh, about the implementation status, uh, currently the uh, CC described in this draft uh, has been implemented uh, by Cisco, Huawei, Nokia, Acoos, uh, Juniper, uh, Marvel, Broadcom, ZTE, H3C, Rigie, and several other uh, vendors. Uh, we also uh, add the reference to the open source for the CC implementations. Uh, we also added uh, the reference to the past 
and uh, ongoing uh, interoperation tests, uh, such as uh, uh, in tech uh, 2023. So the next page. Yeah, so this part we will uh, report uh, uh, how we addressed uh, the open issues. For the first issue, uh, the clarity on one or multiple data plan solutions. Uh, as you know, um, when we uh, have the discussion on the adoption call, uh, uh, the working group uh, has said that uh, it wants to standardize one uh, data plan solution. Uh, so now uh, we give the resolution, all the seats of the SRB6 data plan uh, defined in this draft and uh, other drafts can coexist in the same SRH. It makes uh, SRB6 uh, a single uh, consistent data plan solution. So we believe the issue have been resolved. So next page. Uh, before we go on to the next page, if I may, Wei Ching, this is yeah. Joel Halpern in his role as co-chair. All of the issues that he is now going through, we will be confirming with the list that the resolutions are acceptable before we declare them to be closed because the working group owns the issues. The authors have quite appropriately put in their resolution, which is what we want, and then the working group will need to confirm. We will be particularly looking for discussion on this issue one, because that was a, an issue of concern, and we want to make sure the working group is happy with it. I suspect we are, actually, but we will be looking for substantive feedback on that one to make sure, because I don't want to be putting words in anybody else's mouth. So just to let you know what we're going to do with these, but we very much appreciate the authors going through and putting the resolutions in the tickets. Thank you. Okay. Going to the next slide now, Wei Chen. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and uh, uh, here I also want to uh, mention that uh, uh, authors also update uh, the uh, GitHub -er. Uh, web page, uh, all the text uh, is the same with here. So as you just mentioned, uh, uh, we also like a uh, uh, working group to review those uh, uh, resolution and uh, close those uh, open issues. Okay, uh, for the issue two, oh, sorry, please go back to uh, issue two. Yeah, uh, this issue uh, is about uh, the uh, conformance to existing RFCs. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, in particular, uh, it uh, means that uh, the draft uh, cannot go to working group last call until six months complete handing uh, of a uh, draft that deal with uh, relationships of uh, CCs to RFC 4291. And uh, currently, uh, the draft uh, have been uh, last called, uh, the last call have been done. So we believe uh, the issue have been resolved. Okay, next page. So for issue three, uh, updated uh, definition for the uh, segment life field. Uh, in the the resolution is uh, uh, Irata uh, seventy one o two for RFC uh, eighty seven fifty four. Uh, currently. Uh, you can see uh, in the uh, section 4.4 uh, 
of uh, RFC 80, uh, 8200 uh, uh, specifically for SIH. The number of uh, unprocessed 128 bit entries uh, in the segment list. So uh, it has been verified. The next page. Yeah, for the open issue four, the uh, implications on SIH based on filtering uh, policies. Uh, so uh, the resolution here is that we added the text in the revision one, uh, indicating that the SRV6 security model uh, also uh, applies here. Uh, you, you can refer to the section 5.1 of the RFC uh, 8754. And uh, the SRV6 security model uses IP address uh, filtering. Uh, uh, that's a uh, SF6 uh, seed block, and uh, it do doesn't rely on the presence of uh, SIH. So we believe uh, this issue can be closed. Okay, next uh, page. Yeah, about uh, issue five, uh, SMP v6 troubleshooting in presence of the uh, six seats. Uh, so the resolution is that we added text in revision three, uh, generalizing the RFC 8754 uh, behavior. Uh, it uh, repeatedly applying the seed behavior until doing so would result in processing the up layer header. And the, the destination address at the last uh, iteration is the uh, ultimate destination of the packet. So uh, the issue have been solved. So next page. Okay, the conclusion uh, is that uh, the draft uh, have been mature and uh, multi uh, production from uh, uh, different vendors have been deployed or uh, we have uh, verified uh, them based on uh, lab trails. Uh, so also, believe the work is done. Uh, here we also uh, thank you to everyone who provided the comments, feedback, and the suggestion. So next step, uh, we would like to work together with uh, working group chairs and everyone uh, to reflect the closure of the issue in the tracker. Uh, as I just mentioned, all the issue uh, resolution text have been updated to the uh, GitHub and uh, please review them. And uh, any comments or feedback are welcome. So thank you very much. We're out of time, so we won't have time for comments now. Please send comments to the list. As chair, I will observe, given what the authors have said and our thanks to the authors for all the, their work, now would be a really good time for interested parties to do a detailed and thorough review of the document because we're gonna be moving on the issues and then moving on to trying to move the document forward and detailed review would be really helpful for our determining what state the document is really in from the working group's perspective. 
Thank you. We're now going to move on. Thank you. Uh, Greg, you're up for a BFD. Make it easy. Okay. Your deck is up. Thank you. Okay, so um, this is update. Introduce yourself first. Ah, yeah, uh, Greg Mirsky Erickson. Uh, so this is an update on uh, the work for um, uh, BFD in uh, segment routing with the MPLS data plane. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, we had a good discussion and there was a question of um, uh, that uh, whether it's uh, uh, what BFD is monitors in a segment routing environment because uh, we use this uh, notion of uh, segment routing policy. So um, is it really uh, BFD is capable of reliably monitoring uh, segment routing policy? or it's uh, something different. So that's what we looked at. Uh, and uh, starting with the, uh, going back to the ROC 5880 that defines the BFD, and in abstract, it clarifies what uh, BFD is uh, monitoring. So it um, monitors the bi-directional path between two forwarding engines, and to certain level, the engines themselves. So it clearly points out that uh, the monitored uh, entities, they exist in the forwarding plane between two systems. So uh, then uh, comparing and uh, I'm just learning what SR policy definition is. So the um, SR policy is, is constructed of um, different types of uh, segments. And instructions, uh, there are topological or service-based. Uh, so their understanding is that uh, SR policy is a service instruction, whereas their uh, candidate path, and there might be for the given uh, SR policy, a number, a set of candidate paths. These are topological. So based on that, uh, it seems that uh, BFD-based mechanism monitors not a SAR policy itself as it's defined, but a candidate path, a particular candidate path that is part of their SAR policy. So that's something that we want to uh, put forward and uh, really uh, get your uh, feedback and comments uh, on the list, because I believe that is important to have clarity and uh, common understanding. So when we talk about what BFD-based mechanism, and it's not necessarily only BFD mechanism based on uh, 5880, asynchronous, or point-to-multipoint uh, in 8562, but as well as any other BFD-based mechanism. So the BFD-based mechanism monitors a candidate path of a SAR policy. Uh, further, in updating the document, uh, following on suggestions that we received in the comments after a uh, previous presentation, uh, we added a section uh, that clarifies the applicability specifically of SBFD. And uh, it uh, seems uh, reasonable to point out that SBFD mechanism, because of its characteristic, is applicable only to point-to-point -point, uh, policies or candidate paths, whereas their uh, BFD with its uh, 8562 can be applied to point-to-multipoint. Or 8563 can use active tails, so then uh, it will have a mechanism uh, to notify the root of the uh, tails, uh, how they perceive their um, distribution tree. 
So um, we invite you to uh, review the document, the update, share your comments, questions, and uh, we would like um, to have a consideration for the working group last call. Ketan, you have a question. Uh, Ketan Talaulikar, Cisco. Uh, Greg, thanks for taking in the feedback and adding SBFD uh, in the document. Uh, so if you go to the previous slide, I had one comment on that one. Uh, uh, the actually under a SR policy candidate path, we can have segment lists. Uh, and there we do uh, load balancing between the segment list. So if we want to monitor the path, perhaps we need to monitor on a per segment list basis. Uh, yes, you're right. Again, um, in, in my opinion, so if we have uh, ECMP environment uh, within the segment routing, so basically it's not strict, it's strict loose, right? So then, uh, yes, uh, then each of the paths that uh, compose uh, their ECMP environment for the given candidate path itself presents a candidate path. Uh, so then basically ECMP environment creates a multiplicity of candidate paths for the given SR. And then yes, uh, understanding the uh, balancing mechanism that needs to be applied so that uh, a BFD in, uh, underlay encapsulation uses the same encapsulation as data packets that expected to traverse a particular candidate path. Okay, so just a clarification, we're not talk, I was not talking about uh, strict or loose uh, mm -hmm. paths, but uh, so each segment list could have be strict or loose, but there is a, uh, if you look at uh, SR, uh, SR policy architecture draft 9256, the actual path, like equivalent to a LSP, uh, is at the segment list level. So we should perhaps be monitoring that, uh, each of them. Uh, yes. We can take it offline. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. actually, if you can provide, because I, I think that it, yeah, let's discuss the sure, exact sure. wording that what you envision. Okay. Uh, on, on the next slide, uh, you have uh, mentioned uh, about uh, probability of detecting defects in the IP network. So I believe you're talking about a return path, but that's something which is common for, for all sorts of BFD. But I'm wondering uh, why it is mentioned only in this SBFD section, perhaps. Okay. It yeah. Be taken uh, out. yeah, actually, uh, as one of the uh, earlier proposals in this document, so this document proposes uh, non-FAC uh, TOV that can uh, include um, their segment list as uh, labels to use for uh, the reverse path. So uh, basically because we are using LSP ping to bootstrap a session and uh, extending the mechanisms that are defined in um, draft uh, BFD directed that proposes to use um, to basically to instruct the remote BFD uh, here to use a particular uh, path through the MPLS network. So then uh, for the uh, SR MPLS, we can start to use a particular segment list for the BFD session. So basically then uh, the communication of BFD packets asynchronously transmitted by peers will go uh, always over the SR MPLS network. Okay, uh, so I'll take it to the list. Uh, the same is possible with SBFD, uh, but let's take it to the list because- I Yes, actually people. that's uh, questionable that it's possible because the, I, my understanding of SBFD is it does not create a state uh, on a remote system. Jeff, I was- Go ahead, correct. Jeff. You're correct about that, Greg. Um, sorry, Jeff, I for the microphone. Uh, so, Greg, uh, I think to your broader question about what is being protected, the candidate paths probably are what makes sense based on what I understand of the spring architecture. Uh, one of the things that came through IDR, this most recent session, was draft Chen IDR BGP SR policy CP validity. You can see the agenda for it. 
I don't have strong opinions about that uh, proposal at the moment, but it also raises a uh, possible bit of thinking for you that the candidate paths are being protected by BFD. And really what you're doing as part of uh, using the candidate paths is you're providing an input for the candidate path validity procedure. And once you've decided things are valid or invalid, this means that the rest of the spring procedures for using these candidate paths then take no effect. So maybe that will help clarify your text. Mm, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll need to think about it and I'll reach out to you for uh, more better understanding. Okay, well, uh, thank you for your questions. And uh, as I said, uh, I greatly appreciate uh, your feedback on the list uh, questions and uh, uh, hope that we can converge soon and move this uh, work further. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rakesh Gandhi from Cisco Systems and uh, presenting the draft on uh, enhanced uh, performance measurement using uh, STAMP in segment routing networks on behalf of the uh, authors uh, listed here. Next slide, please. So in agenda, uh, we look at the requirements and scope. Um, this is a segment routing network. So um, we have two data planes, SRMPLS and SRV6. So as a summary of the solutions uh, that's uh, uh, presented uh, and the next steps. Next slide. So requirements and scope, uh, it, it is uh, PM in SR networks um, for SR parts, which includes the SR policies, uh, segment list, uh, for example, for both SRMPLS and SRV6 data planes. So goal here is to uh, uh, have no stamp uh, protocol uh, dependency on session reflector. So state is in the packet. Uh, that's, that's the spirit of SR. And uh, like to achieve the higher uh, session scale and faster measurement interval uh, for a lot of new use cases that's coming up uh, using SR. And the scope is, uh, is, is basically using the stamp. Um, IPPM has a RFC, uh, very good uh, work there. So uh, we're using that. And uh, uh, we have working group document on SRPM. So this is a, a very small extension for uh, one more defined in the existing working group document. Uh, next slide, please. So just a recap of uh, what, what is in the working group document uh, on SRPM today. Uh, it describes three measurement modes for the um, SR. Uh, one way measurement mode, um, which is T2 minus T1. So if you uh, remember from STEM, we have a T1 is a transmit and T2 is a receive on the forward path uh, timestamp and the uh, reverse path, uh, there is a T3 is the uh, transmit and T4 is a receive timestamp on the re reverse path. So if clocks are synchronized, the latency is T2 minus T1. Uh, otherwise we have a, a round trip delay uh, and these are defined in RFC 8762 and then explained or elaborated for SR in the SRPM draft. And it defines uh, another measurement mode, uh, look back measurement mode. And uh, in, in the new draft, we are uh, doing uh, some enhancement to that. Um, uh, and we'll explain what that is. The next slide. So just to recap, uh, what is the look back uh, mode for SR path? Uh, it's basically um, uh, the test packets are sent in, on SR path. And the uh, reflector uh, basically just uh, forwards the packet uh, like data traffic. So there is uh, no stamp test uh, packet processing is done, means there is no UDP point or reinject of the packet. Um, and there are use cases where um, uh, this is quite uh, uh, useful, where the reflector is, uh, is not capable of uh, either time stamping and hardware or um, doing, uh, does not support the protocol. And uh, we get the loopback delay T4 minus T1. So this is what there in the SRPM draft today. Next slide, please. So we're enhancing this uh, uh, with uh, uh, taking advantage of the 
uh, endpoint uh, functions in segment routing. Uh, so what, what's done here is to optimize the, um, the UDP uh, uh, punt and uh, inject uh, part on the session reflector and uh, replace with the endpoint behavior. This is to achieve, uh, again, the goal of uh, higher uh, scale and the faster interval uh, by collecting the timestamp in the fast path. Um, and again, now we have all things we need, T1, T2, T3, T4 in the, in the step. So uh, how do we do it? Um, so next slide. So just a recap of stamp. Uh, stamp already has a, a T2 timestamp in the packet. So we are using that, uh, so it is a standard uh, packet uh, we, we are using. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we do this with SRV6? Uh, it's a uh, new endpoint function um, that is carried uh, with the uh, locator seed of the reflector. And it just triggers this behavior to collect the timestamp in fast data path. And uh, it, reverse path can be IP UDP or it can be uh, SR. Uh, v6 uh, and it, it will be encoded in the segment list uh, if that is the case. So it's just fairly sim uh, simple uh, endpoint behavior that uh, does the trick. Uh, how do we do it for MPLS? Uh, um, so thanks to all the uh, great work that was done uh, by the MPLS working group, we adopted the MNA uh, solution at the last ITF. So we're use using that, uh, defining a new opcode uh, for, for this behavior and uh, uh, that's basically it. Uh, so um, uh, with MNA, uh, it carries the uh, opcode to do this behavior. If it's uh, if I written path is IPUDP, then it's at the bottom of the stack. If it's uh, written path is uh, uh, SRMPLS again, then it would be uh, uh, just before the uh, reflector uh, uh, label. So uh, you have select scope for it. So this is just uh, using the existing um, solutions from MNA. Uh, next slide, please. So it's, um, it's a very small extension to the loopback mode that's already in the SRPM draft to uh, improve it um, thanks to the, the, the endpoint behavior. And um, we request your uh, review comments and suggestion. And uh, I think um, uh, to avoid the duplication of uh, having too many documents and reviews and, and uh, optimize uh, uh, the, the work, uh, maybe we can add this uh, small extension in the existing SRPM draft. So that's all I had, uh, thanks. Any questions or comments or concerns from the, from the participants? If not, we'll move on to the next deck. Uh, yeah, before we go, uh, just the show of hands really quick. Uh, everyone understood we're trying, or not we, but the authors are requesting to merge their draft with an existing working group draft, right? Anyone can nod their head? Okay, great. <laughs> One person's not in their head. Perfect. So just show hands. Any objections? Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, thanks. We will, of course, confirm it on the list. Thank you. Thank you. And we now need the SBFD consistency. Cheng Wang. Hey, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this is Chang Wang Lin from New HCC Technology, and I will present this draft. This draft is about BFD in SR network. Next page, please. Uh, so background, BFD can be used to monitor paths between nodes. SBLD is suitable for large scale network and the sporting verification on the reflector. reflector. UBFD can effectively reduce the device requirement. SBLD and UBLD could be used to monitor SR policy. A session associated with a segment list to detect the state of SR policies candidate paths. Uh, next page. Uh, before you continue, Greg, did you have a question you wanted to raise promptly? You raised your hand. Okay. Okay. Uh, next page. 
Yeah, when we use the SPFD to monitor SI policy, the control packet is forward to reflect according to its associated set list, and the response packet is usually forward to the initiator through IP routing. So the forwarding and the reward paths of the packet are likely inconsistent as shown in the finger. Uh, the failure on the path DEA will cause a fast positive issues. So the constants of the forward and the reward path should be guaranteed. The situation is similar in UBFD when where the node D director return the BFD packet to the node A in the data plane and the return path should be consistent with the forward path. Uh, this draft describes how SBFD and uh, UBFD to achieve the, the bidirectional path contents of packet when moni monitoring SR policy. Next page, please. Uh, the method for SBFD is based on path segment. Path segment is defined to identify the uh, as, SR path, such as a set list of path segment of candy path. Path segment can be used to correlate the two of any directional SR path at both end nodes. The draft of ITF. SR policy path segment proposed uh, an intention of BDP SR policy to dispute the SR policy with carrying path segment and bidirectional path information. Through this intention, when dispute SR policy to the head and the reward path information and the path segment of the set list could be carried together. Uh, in this way, node A and node D in the instance, have two path segments which are associated by directional paths. Next page, please. Uh, the head end node in both directions need to create a table to map path segment and reward path segment to local segment. Uh, through the mapping table, the head end node has the ability to get a segment list by path segment or reward path segment. Next page, please. Uh, the procedure of SBFD in SRV6. The example in this slide is node A as an initial, which has a SBFD. Are you still there? We seem to have lost your audio. It was just went silent. Uh, we seem to have a problem. Uh, can you hear me? There, yes, you're back. Thank you, continue. Uh, you have five minutes left, please keep going. Yeah, okay. First of all, the search in, encapsulated with the second list of one to the control the Packet if it has pass M, then encapsulate the pass M in as such and set P flag. Then the control bit reach the flag, which will the pass M of forward pass. Next page, please. Okay, for the reflector of node D, SBFD need as a bit. Uh, need to detect the SRH and get the path segment from the SRH, then get the segment for the response control packet by the forward path segment. Using the path segment, the forward and the reward paths of SBFD are guaranteed to be consistent in SRV6. Next page. Uh, in SR, MPLs, the processing of SPFD is similar. 
uh, when the initiate encapsulate the control packet, it need to push the path segment into the label state at the same time, and the top label is path segment. Next page. After receiving the SPFD, if there is a path segment in the packet, so the reflector will use the path segment to search for the corresponding set list in the matching table and uh, encapsulate the response packet for the return path. Uh, next page. Uh, for UBFD, the return path can be directly encapsulated in the packet. After the tail node receive the packet, it can directly return the packet to the head node in the data plane according to the specified path. Uh, the complete reverse segment can be distributed to the head node along with the segment list. So the reverse segment can be, can be used to specify the return path of UBFD. Uh, next page. Uh, so these two slides of the broad overview about the UBFD encapsulation for SRV6 network the reverse segment list can be encapsulated in a separate SRH or in the same SRH will forward segment list. Next page. For SRNPL's network, the reverse segment list is encapsulated in the label stack along with the forwarding segment. By encapsulate the packet in this way, whether it is in SRV6 or SRMPLs, the tail node can directly return the packet along the same path to the head node after receiving it. The next page. Uh, this draft uh, has been presented at the ITF 114 and the outer ITF 115, we add both the SBFD and UBFD, also add SRMPLs and SRV6. Uh, let's all, any questions or comments are welcome. Thank you. Go ahead, Greg. Thank you, uh, Greg Mirsky Erickson. Um, I have a couple of questions on uh, applicability of you. Um, Unaffiliated BFD, uh, UBFD uh, to this scenario. Um, there seems to be some problem because uh, the current um, version of the working group uh, specification for UBFD uh, requires that uh, the sender of uh, their um, unaffiliated BFD echo packet sets uh, TTL to 255 and a uh, system that receives. Uh, the packet with TTL anything but 254 drops the packet. So that seems to be that uh, their applicability of UBFD is only to a single hop system. Um, so I don't think that's uh, the scenario that you are addressing because at least in your uh, network diagram, there were uh, more than a single uh, link between uh, these systems. Uh, the second question I have is about how this mapping between um, segment list one and segment list two occurs on a system that receives a BFD packet, uh, whether it's a reflector or a echo reflector, because uh, it's not obvious that um, there is a demultiplexing uh, basically on, uh, so there is any processing used on uh, your discriminator. So it seems that all association is uh, in the forwarding plane. So thus, there is no uh, really confirming, uh, and there is no reliable way to say that, yes, the system that advertised this discriminator, as in SBFD case, really processed and validated the packet. So it uh, seems that all the processing is in the forwarding plane. So in fact, the BFD is not involved. 
and there is no assurance that you really reached the intended target, yeah, it came back over some arbitrary path that was not really hard to verify. This sounds like a discussion that needs mm -hmm. to be taken to the list. Thank you. It's more detailed than I think we have time to cover right now. I wish we had enough time, but we don't. Yes, thank you. DJ, you're up. DJ, are you there? Yes, it says you're here. We can't hear you. Please speak again. Okay, DJ, you seem to have Can some you hear audio. Me? There, yes, yeah. please, go uh, ahead. Okay. Yeah, yes, thanks. Um, sorry about that. Uh, hello, everybody, I'm Dhananjay Rao from Cisco Systems, giving an update on the color aware routing intent aware, uh, uh, you know, intent aware routing using color problem statement on behalf of our co-authors. Um, this uh, problem statement was presented first at IETF 114, and it was a uh, merged problem statement uh, of the seamless SR and the uh, card problem statement drafts. Uh, since then, we've added uh, you know, a couple of versions adding uh, more uh, requirements and use cases. Um, in this current version, um, we've added uh, multicast requirements uh, related to intent and also addressed a few comments that we received on the mailing list. Um, next slide, please. So the multicast requirements follow largely the same pattern as what is already in the draft uh, with respect to unicast. Um, you know, the creation of multicast distribution trees uh, addressing different types of uh, intent, uh, you know, such as uh, minimal latency, um, you know, node avoidance in certain regions, um, you know, uh, for trees for certain, you know, bandwidth uh, requirements, uh, as well as you know, uh, multicast distribution trees that use a subset of the topology. Uh, you know, a few of the ones that are included. Um, next slide, please. Uh, additionally, I mean, today we have uh, different types of multicast transport technologies in deployments. Uh, so, as requirements, uh, we've enumerated. You know, the most common ones. Um, in uh, both with respect to MPLS, uh, SR MPLS, SRV6, uh, as well as native IP. Um, next slide. Um, we also addressed some comments uh, as mentioned. Uh, a couple of key ones uh, are, uh, I think this is, uh, Joel, this is probably still the older version of the slides. Uh, as essentially in the previous, uh, version, we had a section on uh, you know, extending uh, the intent aware routing to customer networks. Um, so we received some feedback on that. Um, you know, so essentially, if there's fallback, um, you know, some way to indicate uh, you know, from the PE onwards uh, the, the fact that there has been you know, fallback in the uh, provider network to a you know, different intent uh, path. Um, also, you know, the ability to allow uh, hosts or applications that are not uh, you know, uh, participating in routing to indicate the intent requirement for flows that they send uh, typically via setting DSCP in the packet header. So we included that. Next next slide, please. Okay, uh, so yeah, so th that's all. Uh, um, the draft is largely, you know, stable. Uh, the last set of updates we had so we think the draft is ready for working group adoption and would like to you know, reiterate that request. Thank you. We don't see anybody on the queue. I don't see anybody leaping up. So we'll go to the next presentation. Thank you. Uh, just a quick comment, DJ, on that. You have um, many, many authors on that document. Please yes. cut that down to yes. five. 
Yes, Thank yes. Uh, Joel, we'll talk to Joel uh, about it. Yeah, we'll be doing that. Thanks. So, so can you help me? When you go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Wen Yin from China Mobile. I will present the ESTA policy group draft. Uh, next page, please. Next page, please. Uh, first, let's see the concept of parent test ESTA policy. According to this draft, according to this RFC, the parent ESTA policy is introduced in RFC. Uh, 9256. According to this RFC, a parent ESA policy is the compo composite candidate pass that acts as a container for grouping ESA policies which meet different service optimization objectives and constraints and have the same destination and point. Uh, however, RFC 9256 does not mention scenario for the use of the parent ESA policy. Uh, the, therefore, this draft defines an application scenario where the parent ESA policy can be fully utilized. Mm. When enterprise customer often, oh, go, go ahead. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, one enterprise customer often have several different kinds of services with different SLAs. SLAs we consider cons consider that the parent as a policy can be well used for the following scenarios. Uh, a point to point list line customer have multi multiple services and these services need to be forwarded from different SR policy paths with different SLAs. Uh, these different SR policies can be represented by a parent SR policy. Um, for example, an mm, uh, enterprise customer has a list line demand from P1 to P2, then three types of services need to be transferred between, between P1 and P, P2, uh, such as um, voice service with low delay requirement, uh, video service with high bandwidth requirement, and other services. Uh, first, the different service, services are identified through DHCP, and each DHCP mapping to different color such as color one, color two, um, and color three. Uh, then uh, we must, we should generate a parent as a policy between P1 and P2, which includes three constituent as a policies that support different SLA uh, with color value of color one, um, color two, and color three. When the traffic arrives at P1, it first matched to the parent as a policy according to the desktop and the color of the route, and then find the mapped to a constituent as a policy in the parent as a policy according to the DSCP carriage in the IPv6 package header. The Voice traffic is forwarded according to the path of load delay policy A, and video traffic is forwarded according to the path of high bandwidth policy B, and other traffic are carried by policy C. From this is example, we can see that the parent has a policy can be well applied to scenarios where there are multi multiple different services traffic transferred between two sites. Uh, but however, in reality, we found that VPN tenders often have multi multiple sites with more than 10 sites being very common. 
next next page, please. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, this draft proposes the term SR policy group, and as our policy group is an instantiation of a group of constituent parent SR policies to different destination endpoints with the same service forwarding model. The application scenario for the SR policy group is a multi-site whipping customers with se several different services. The benefits of introducing the SR policy group are uh, as following. <clears throat> Uh, first is a simplified deployment. Uh, secondly, um, efficiently solving complex configuration problems in multi-site and multi-service scenarios. Next page, please. Um, this slide shows show the relationship between SR policy, parent SR policy, and SR policy group. Uh, a parent SR policy is a set of SR policies which have the same destination and point. And an and a SR policy group uh, represents a service forwarding model that is associated with one or more parent SR policies. The color of SR group, policy group and is each constituent parent SR policy must be identical. Uh, that is color one uh, equals color two. And the color of SR policy group and is each constituent as a policy of each constituent parent SR policies must be different. Uh, that is um, color one must not be equal to three, color three. Uh, they can be only one, and they can be only one parent SR policy with the same source endpoint and the same destination endpoint in an SR policy group. Uh, let's see an example of information model. Uh, next page, please. Before that, Katan, you've asked to ask a question, so go ahead. Uh, Ketan Talaulikar, Cisco, a couple of comments. Uh, what is called as a parent SR policy in this uh, document, uh, it's referred to as composite candidate path in the RFC 9256. The reason why we were specifically asked by the working group not to put in use cases and other things into that draft. That was the reason why uh, it was not there. And I'm, I, I want to know whether we want to document use cases uh, in this document. The second part is that from what I understand of, uh, of this uh, policy grouping, it's really a configuration template. And the question is, is this something that needs to be standardized? Because different uh, vendors and different operators may want all sorts of templates uh, to ease the SR policy configuration. Do we need to standardize them? Well, you seem to have prompted some comments, Luis. Okay, thanks. Just, just hold on, Luis. You put yourself on the queue. I okay, I, I'll go ahead. Well, wait, Wei Ching, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you, Chang. I just don't want to respond. To uh, just uh, Kenton's uh, question. Uh, I think for the uh, parent SR policy, uh, as uh, Kenton just mentioned, which have been defined in uh, the other draft, and for the uh, uh, policy group, uh, which is a, a, a new idea, uh, I don't think it, uh, the draft will introduce some uh, extension to the SR basic policy, uh, but uh, as I know, if we use the hierarchical uh, solution, uh, it will uh, simplify the configuration uh, dramatically. Uh, so maybe uh, this draft can be an informational draft, but uh, I hope a working group can adopt it because uh, uh, based on our 
experience. Uh, the solution really uh, useful uh, and uh, I uh, uh, hope uh, uh, we can discuss it uh, in the working group. Uh, as a uh, cause, thank you. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that it is informational. Uh, I leave it to the working group uh, if it wants to look at this or not. Thank you. Uh, Jim, thank you. please move quickly. We're running a little short of time. So I uh, just responded to Ketan. It's actually a standards track document right now. That needs to change if uh, based on that conversation, but I just wanted to point out it isn't informational. Okay, thank you. This, this sounds like an issue that should be followed up more on the list because if this duplicates stuff that's already available, we need to differentiate that from if this is defining a new capability. Um, we will keep going for now, but uh, you need to move very quickly through your remaining slides. We're over time. Okay, thanks. Mm, I'll continue. Uh, this uh, this is an, an example for an informational model. In this example, and uh, uh, let's see the use case for SR policy group. Mm. Uh, this is a use case for the SR groups in a uh, multi site uh, multi multi site VPN talent scenario. VPN one has have three sites, and each site needs trans transmit traffic with three different SLA to other sites. First, the, we need to configure an SR policy group from VPN1 customers with a color value of one and contains three types of service uh, templates corresponding to colors 100, 200, and 300. Uh, second, take uh, the headache H1 as an example. It needs to automatically generate different parent policies for other site access routes. For endpoint E1, a parent policy PP1 is automatically generated with color one and uh, contains SR policy 11, SR policy 12, and SR policy 13, each with different SLAs. The head end of all three SR policies is H1, and the endpoint are E1, and the colors are 100, 200, and 300. Hi, uh, um, I'm sorry, we need to move on. Can we wrap this up? We're already over time. Uh, is it okay we jump to your last slide? Oh, okay. Uh, ne next slide, Thank please. You. Next picture. I, 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 I would present the running code. Uh, we have um, now uh, four. We uh, are already uh, over time, so please just oh, wrap sorry, up this sorry. last slide, and then we'll take any other comments to the list. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mm. Uh, compared to which. Yeah, one word. Uh, so, uh, calls us uh, uh, hope to ask for uh, working group adoption as an uh, informational draft. Thank you. Okay, we're now on to your next slide deck. And uh, please be prompt. You have a smaller number of slides, but also less time. So, Yi Song, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hi, yes, everyone. we can hear you. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yi Sung Liu from China Mobile. Uh, I'll uh, present on uh, behalf of my co authors to the uh, flexible uh, <clears throat> path selection. Uh, according to the RFC uh, 9256, as long as there is a valid segment list in the active candidate path, so the Active any candidate path is valid, so that means uh, uh, all of the uh, segment lists in one uh, candidate path are uh, uh, become invalid. The the path then we think the uh, the path uh, become invalid. Uh, so, but uh, in some scenario, uh, the remaining segment list may not meet the uh, 
for wooding performance requirements such as insufficient bandwidth, excessive delay, or to high uh, packet loss rate. Uh, for example, in this uh, slide, uh, in the uh, CP1, we have a uh, uh, three SL, uh, but uh, SL1 and uh, SL2 become invalid. Even if uh, we have a, a CP2 with a low, lower preference that can meet the bandwidth requirements uh, with the uh, uh, three SLs, uh, each one has the bandwidth with the 100 megabits. Uh, we, uh, the, the traffic uh, uh, need uh, the bandwidth uh, uh, at least uh, 150 megabits. But the traffic will continue to uh, to be forwarded along the CP1, and we will now to uh, switch to the uh, CP2. So next slide, please. So in this draft, we uh, want to uh, uh, consider a mechanism for the flexible candidate path selection. So take the forwarding quality requirements and the resource requirements of the candidate path as the selection criteria of the uh, candidate path. So firstly, uh, we check the, whether the path meets the quality requirements. Only the valid path meets the quality requirements can be selected as the active path. So uh, secondly, uh, if multiple Candidate pass meets the quality requirements at the same time, or or uh, fail to meet the requirements. So we select the uh, active pass according uh, to the <coughs> normal uh, no rules according to the uh, RFC <coughs> 9256 uh, section uh, 2.9, and like the uh, preference and the protocol original, etc. So uh, here are some uh, examples of the threshold parameters of the candidates uh, we consider. Uh, for example, for uh, the, uh, for different uh, types of these parameters, we have uh, uh, different rules. Uh, for example. For the available <coughs> bandwidth, a threshold can be specified separately for each segment list. So the threshold of the candidate pass is the sum of the thresholds of the segment list calculated based on the weight. And for the jitter latency or packet loss, uh, any of this uh, segment list uh, in the candidate pass if they don't, it does not uh, meet the specified threshold, we consider that the candidate path does not meet the performance requirements. So one uh, multiple threshold uh, parameters are specified on the uh, candidate path at the same time. Uh, the, the candidate path must uh, meet all of these uh, requirements. Uh, so next slide, please. And this, uh, uh, this slide is about the pro process. And uh, the firstly, uh, we we can uh, pre-configure the uh, threshold parameters on the candidate path of the head node. The secondly, uh, the head node will monitor whether the available resources and the forwarding quality of the SR policy can they pass exceed the uh, threshold and that means the, we will meet the weather uh, meet the uh, requirements uh, the thirdly uh, when the available resources are less than the threshold or uh, the forwarding quality cannot meet the threshold requirements uh, we should uh, select a new one uh, after the the uh, old active path uh, eliminates the fault or improves the forwarding quality. Whether to recover can be specified uh, 
by the configuration, that means the uh, switchback <coughs> depends on the configuration. So for avoiding pass uh, switching uh, frequently, we uh, uh, both the uh, over threshold switching and the fault recovery should be uh, delayed. Next slide, please. So here's the example uh, <coughs> at the previous uh, slide. Uh, we can uh, see how this uh, mechanism works. Uh, if the SR1 and SR2 become uh, invalid, uh, we have a, a CP2 uh, can meet the bandwidth. So uh, for this, uh, by this uh, mechanism, the traffic uh, will forward switch to the uh, path of the CP2 for forwarding. So uh, next slide, please. Oh, so that's all. Uh, we we will come the questions on comments. We we want to uh, get more feedback from the working group. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Tom. Looks like you're busy today. Yeah. Go ahead. So just a very short one. Uh, there is another draft on CP candidate path validity. Uh, it was not presented, but I, I remember seeing it. So uh, maybe, and that has some different proposals, maybe complementary. Uh, maybe the authors uh, should consider combining the work. Thank you, Ketan. Greg, quickly, please. Uh, Greg Nurski Erickson. Um, I shared their uh, link to a work that uh, we're doing at IPPM Working Group and uh, appreciate your consideration. Um, it seems that uh, it addresses uh, multi uh, SLO environment and might be applicable to this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew Stone, go ahead. Um, Andrew Stone, Nokia, just a question. It describes bandwidth utilization. Is that utilization on the head end or utilization on the path? Uh, the the util uh, the bandwidth utilization uh, we would uh, detect uh, on the uh, on the head node. Okay. So uh, for for every uh, second list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Cheng Li, go ahead. Hello, Johnny from Huawei. I think this uh, extension is quite useful to me. So uh, I have interest in on this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Kayan, go ahead. We're going to close the queue at this point. Thank you. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, so with the future, does it make the, the policy, I guess, probably more dynamic, I guess, versus static? I guess that, that's just a brief su I guess, summary of seems like what, what this policy does. I guess normally, I guess, when you have a policy, there's a different picking mechanism, and I guess each implementation may have different methods of picking the best best path, candidate path. But now, with this with this uh, feature or uh, solution, um, you're we're with with these added constraints. You're now making it. Um, you're adding intelligence to the picking of the candidate path. That's a, uh, that's just a question, but I believe that's what it sounds like with this. Uh, this draft it, it seems to do it it's kind of an automated, but a, a more intelligent method of uh, picking the best path. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll go on to the next presentation. Meng Xiao, Meng Xiao, you're up. Hello, everyone. This is Meng Xiao Chen from CC Technology. Uh, please speak closer to your microphone. We're having trouble hearing you. Okay. How about now? Uh, can you hear me? There. Now we can hear you. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, this is Meng Xiao Chen from New H3C Technologies. Our draft is about SRV6 contacts indicator seats for segment routing aware services. Next slide, please. Uh, segment routing aware service means a service node can process segment routing information in the packets it receives. 
For example, if an SRware firewall wants to filter SRv6 traffic based on its final destination, it will retrieve that information from the last entry in the SRH rather than the destination address field of the IPv6 header. Uh, in the working group draft of segment routing service programming, only one SRv6 endpoint behavior for SR aware function is defined as end.an, uh, which is quite general. Uh, service specific functions are not included. Our draft defines new variants of uh, end.an behavior. Uh, which are used as context indicator for SR aware services. Next slide, please. Uh, context indicator seed can provide the context on how to process a packet for SR aware service nodes. A typical application is the SR aware firewall, as shown in the figure. The firewall assigns a context indicator seed called end.an.ci, which is a variant of end.an. Uh, and the seed is associated with one or multiple virtual firewall instances, uh, which have some rules for specific VPN packets. Uh, the controller organizes uh, context indicator seed in the SRv6 path. Uh, when the firewall receives the packet, it identifies a virtual firewall instance based on the context indicator seed and then applies VPN specific rules for inner packet. Context indicator seed can be static or dynamic. Static means the context indicator seed is associated with a certain context. It is usually a one-to-one -one mapping. For example, seed one to instance one, seed two to instance two. Uh, dynamic means uh, context indicator. Uh, Ming Xiao, one. we need you to get back closer to your mic. We're having oh, a sorry. very, very hard time listening. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. Now you're really close to your mic. Um, so yes, we can hear everything. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, dynamic means uh, context indicator seed is associated with multiple contexts. It is like a uh, one-to-many mapping. Uh, for example, a seed can be associated with several different instances. The head end node will fill additional context information in the packet when it steals the traffic into the SR policy. Combined with the dynamic seed and additional information added by the head end, a specific context can be identified by the firewall. Uh, why we need to define new behaviors other than end.an? Uh, there are two motivations. One is that specific functions would be more friendly to implementations of SR aware service nodes. Uh, secondly, uh, for the dynamic context indicator case, the head end node needs to determine its action to fill additional context information. A specific behavior can be helpful. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, new endpoint behaviors are defined in the draft. They are variants of end.an. Uh, CI.S stands for static context indicator. CI.D stands for dynamic context indicator. Uh, based on the different positions where the variable context information is carried, there are four subtypes. A for arguments in seed, T for SRH tag, B for SRH TRV and D for DOH option. Uh, next slide, please. Before we do that, Daniel, you have put yourself on the queue. You have a question, please ask. Daniel Bernibel, Canada. Um, 
but maybe I can wait for him to finish. Okay, and... we'll go through and you'll you'll ask at the end. Here's slide. Uh, Th these are <laughs> well. It looks like this is I, the I right time to ask questions. <laughs> go ahead, Daniel. Okay, so the first question is: Do you plan in a, intend this to become an informational draft or a standards draft? Uh, it's a standard draft. So, uh, first question: What happens if you send those information in, and the service aware function doesn't really know what to do with them? Is it, it's not specified in the draft. You drop the packet. Do you send a reply? Do you just do some magic and imp try to uh, improvise what to, what to do? Uh, uh, so the context indicator seed uh, is just to provide the information about the context. Uh, it does not uh, have the instructions to uh, do such as uh, add some segments into the SIH or something. Yeah, so the part, like, if you have a service aware function that doesn't know what to do with those because it doesn't really understand or doesn't comply to those, what happens? That was my question. Maybe you can follow on the list. The second one was, um, uh, so would this mean that everybody that creates a service aware function needs to comply to this? Or Because one of the notions of being able to do service uh, SRV6 was that the end function pretty much is on the, on the realm of the, the end function designer. So whatever happens with a SID coming to him can really decide how to do that treatment. Now that makes it that every function would, that would need to be service aware would need to comply to this. Would, I think it's gonna be a challenge. Uh, Maybe thank we you. can continue uh, the discussion on the list. Oh, oh thank you, I was responding the list. Thanks. Thank you. You should, if you're the speaker, you should come up here. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, SR Ampulus FR extension. Next page. So the extension is to provide protections of the middle point of failure after IGP convergence on the failure. I'm going to talk about the extension through example and then through procedures. So for this protection, we cover two cases. Case one, protection for the pass without binding seat. Case two, provide protection for the pass with binding seat after IGP convergence. Let's look at the first case. Next page. <coughs> On the top uh, of this page, we illustrate the existing protection. That means the, pro the protection against the midpoint of failure before IGP convergence. So here we have a pass from, no from node A to P1 and then to node N, node Q1, node C. So in normal operation, after receiving package from CE, node A will push the seeds list for the pass into the package. So this is indicated by, by package one. And then after P1 receives package, P1 pops the seed for P1 and then forward the package using the forwarding table. So this package will send to P3, and then P3 will forward package using the forwarding table and then send the package to node N. So that's the normal operation. But when node N fails, P3 as a PRR will detect the failure of node N, and then P3 will pop the load seed of N and then send the package around the failed node N and then to the next hop, which is Q1. So that's the existing FR protection. However, after IGP convergence on the failure of load N, so in this case, upstream node P1 will receive package from A and pop node seed of P1 
And then at this point, the top seat is a node seat of a field node. And then there's no forward entry for that node. So in this case, without the extension, node N and node P1 will drop that package. So that's illustrated on the bottom figure. So the extension is that upstream node P1 pops seat of node N and then just forward the package using the forwarding table. That means that just for forward the package according to the forwarding entry to the lex hop, which is the Q1, uh, Q1, and that's it. We can see that the extension for this case is simple. Pop the node seed or failed node, and then do the forwarding using the forwarding, forwarding, uh, forwarding table. Now let's look the protection extension for the case two, which is for provide protection of a pass with bundling seed. Next page. There it is. So the top figure illustrates the protection for the node with bundling seed. So here we have a pass from node A to P1 and then node N and then with a bundling seed of node N. So this bundling seed is associated with a seed list, which is for the pass uh, Q1 and uh, C. In the in normal operation, node A will push the seed list, which is uh, seed P for P1 and then seed for N and then bundling seed of node N into the package and then send the package to P1. And then P1 will send the package to P3 and then P3 will send the package to node N. Node N will pop is seed and then replace the bundling seed with the seed list and then forward to the Q1. So that's without failure. So with failure, before IGP convergence, P3 as a PRR will receive the package. And then because of P3 detect the failure of node N, P3 will pop the node seat of node N. And then because the top at this time, the top seat is a bundling seat of node N. P3 as a PRR will replace this bundling seat with a seat list, which consists of seat Q1 and seat C. And then after replace the bundling seat with seat list, P3 will send the package to the legs hop Q1 around the field node. So that's the FR before IGP convergence. After IGP convergence, on the failure of node N. So without the extension, the packet were dropped. So, piece, so that's illustrated on the bottom figure. So P, after IGP conversion on, on the failure, P1 will receive package from A. So this package contains a node seed of P1 and then node seed of N and a binding seed of N. So P1 will pop is a seed. And then at this point, the top seed is a seat of node N, which is failed node. P1 doesn't have forward entry for the failed node. So in this case, without the extension, P1 will drop the package. So the, here, the extension is that P1 pops the seat of failed node N and then replace the binding seed with the seed list. And then just forward the package using the forwarding table. So that's, uh, we can see the procedure extension is, uh, is simple. So this, uh, we already presented the uh, extension three examples. So let's look the extension through procedures. Next page. So here the procedure is on the option node. So after IGP convergence on the failure, so the option node just pop the node seed of node, uh, uh, failed node, which is seed N and then that's the one of the followings. If the top seed is a binding seed, and then we replace the binding seed with a seed list. So if the top seed is a node seed, and then we just do the forwarding, use the forwarding table. So after replace the binding seed with a seed list, we also 
determine whether the top seed is a node seed. If node seed, we just do the forwarding, use the forward table. If the, if it's the adjacency seed of the field node, in this case, we need to replace the adjacency seed with the node seed of the remote node of adjacency, and then do the forwarding, use the forwarding table. We can see those procedures are also simple. So next page. So I would like to uh, welcome comments from everyone. Thank you. So speaking as a participant in this case, not as a chair, I look at this and this seems to require that various nodes in the network can differentiate between receiving an unresolvable SID and knowing, oh, that's a failed node that I'm supposed to work around versus, oh, this is just wrong and I shouldn't be working around anything. And I'm not sure there is a clear procedure to differentiate those two cases. Yeah, that's a very good question. And also, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that we may, maybe we can address in, in different ways. So whether this one is uh, wrong and then this is the missing the seat or if this is the failed nose seat, and then we need to find some way to differentiate that. Also, maybe we can find some way to avoid that. We avoid some, those seat is missing, right? <laughs> this, uh, uh, so we, we need to work on that one. That's, yeah, that's yeah. good comments. Liu Yao. Uh, yeah, Liu Yao from ZT. Tip and... the mic down so we can hear you better, okay. please. <laughs> I, I have a similar question. So you neither need to differentiate these nodes or you have to install all the nodes, uh, build the context table for this. And I think it's hard to implement. Thank you. Uh, looks like not because this one, in fact, uh, there's a separate draft. So here, the separate draft is that that draft will distribute the information for binding seat to the node, arbitrary node, on the path, and then that arbitrary node will have those information, and then with those information, it will just uh, add some entry or some procedure or coding to handle this case. Yeah, but it's not about, only about the binding seed. You have to protect the node seed, the adjacent seed, so you have to build context. Yeah, table, for the adjacent so. and I also have a simple solution because we see, I see we have a controller and then maybe controllers mm -hmm. distribute the, the binding seed to the arbitrary node. So Let's because continue. the controller have more information, they just before distribute that, that's the seed list they can change the adjacent seed of a failed node to the node seed of that remote node. So in I this think case- to see, Allow me to introduce, I think we need to see a description on the list or in a draft yeah, exactly. of how you expect to address this. And then we need to continue the discussion on the list, please. Yeah, good, that's good. Yeah. Andrew. Uh, Andrew Stone, Nokia, just an editorial comment. Uh, this, there's a line that basically says distributing information about the binding set is out of scope. It's kind of nested quite deep and it's a really fundamentally important aspect of this. So if we decide to keep it out of scope, out of scope that's okay. I just think it might be worth popping that up to a higher level in the draft to kind of make it more visible for the working group. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Spring doesn't in. modify routing protocols and therefore it's probably appropriate that it's out of scope for this draft, but you can't solve it without it. Jeff, did you want to add a comment, please? Yeah, very quick. Jeff and Sarah and Vidya. Uh, I disagree with your problem statement to begin with. And uh, if we take your topology, you'll have a not protecting LFA at each node, uh, both not link protecting, right? Practically, if you're trying to protect pass, you'll also have pass protection from the head end. So what you're proposing to do complicates control plane. You still need to distribute binding seeds. It complicates forwarding play, and there's no free lunch in fast pass. And the problem you're trying to solve is really a corner case. So yeah, I, I know. Think you should yeah, be doing this. yeah, it's not free lunch. We need to do something. Yes, right. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, everyone. Hong Yi, you're up. Last presentation. We're on schedule. Thank you.
Thanks. And I'm Hong Yi from Huawei. And this time I want to advertise our draft on SR-based SFC control plan framework. And this is an information draft. Okay, thanks. And, and in this job, we will uh, list all some control plan solutions for current SR-based FCC implementation. And we categorize the implementations into status one, that is uh, status, in, uh, status in SR service programming. And there are also some stable ones that is, sub, is further uh, divided into two subcategories, an SH base, SFC with SR based transport tunnel, and also SR based SFC with integrated and SH service plan. Okay, and in, okay, and in a control plan, there are many true route information to distribute. That first is service function instant route that we uh, collected. Uh, from the nodes to the controller or some other nodes and uh, to to distribute the information about the instant like service time and IP or any other encapsulation and also there is service function pass route that will distribute it by the controller to to the to the to a switch nodes uh, to show to and um, point out the path of service function like as a uh, service pass index and service index to further direct the traffic to go through the certain SFC. Next. And, and in this job, we mainly uh, listed some uh, current uh, and existing control plan solutions and we make a brief comparison between them and in we now we can see there are three categories status and NSH based SFC that is similar to NSH and SR based SFC and w w which is similar to the status one. So we can see that there are several ways to distribute as IR and SPR. Like and um, for status one, we have BGP currently and BGPRs IGP. And for SFPR, we see there are drafts that uh, uh, propose some solutions and like BGP and PCP. And also, um, they can be used to um, to distribute steering policy. And for the other categories, we can see that NSH-based SFC uh, usually adopt similar solutions to NSH uh, ones. And so it use a BGP to distribute as an IR and BGP PSAP to uh, distribute as a PR. And currently only BGP can be used to uh, distribute serum policy. And for the last category, let's just SR-based SFC and I, and it's similar to the status one, so we have the almost the same uh, solutions to the first categories. Yeah. Next. So, and this time we want to ask for some comments and this uh, job has involved into the version nine and we have um, received some suggestion and modify the uh, draft and and we, we see that many drafts included in this control plan framework has um, under maybe undergo RFCQ or uh, has been a working group document. So we hope this um, control plan framework can be also moved toward to working group and and we and in this job we can provide more information for uh, those who want to deploy SFC. Thank you. Okay, any questions for the presenter? Seeing nobody on the list, we get all get a few minutes of our lives back. Thank you very much for the engagement. Really appreciated that. Sorry we didn't have more time for more of the discussions. We'll see you on the list, please, where we have the best discussions. Uh, Cheng Li, you wanted to say something. Go right ahead. Hello? Go right ahead. Yeah, yeah, Johnny from Huawei. 
I just want to, want to say that the, I think this work is useful and and it do ha it, it does have some like value, and and we do really hope that somebody, if you have any interest on this, please go to us. And we can work on this together. Thank you. Thank you. Not our problem. Yeah, no, but there's no they, they automatically take care of that. But there is no button to do it. Time, time does its thing. They have it marked.